Wittgenstein was an Austrian aristocrat. I think that's the first thing to remember about him. His father was the richest man in Austria-Hungary and um, owned steel mills, armaments factories. And Ludwig was the youngest of a, of a large family. His mother was Catholic and his father was Protestant, so there was an internal tension. And as he grew up, he became more and more disgusted with wealth, with ostentation, with uh, display. Purity, integrity were the aims of his, of his life. Uh, he had a very complicated education. <coughs> As a child, he was uh, tutored at home, and so he was very, very well educated, mathematics, languages, and so on. And then as an adolescent, he went to Leintz, to the high school there. Uh, one of his classmates was the well-known Adolf Hitler. Curious coincidence. And then he came back to, to uh, the Technical Hochschule in Berlin, uh, in engineering. His father was pressing him towards that. and. Uh, just before the First World War, he came to Manchester to work in the engineering world, designing aircraft propellers. The aircraft had only just taken off, as it were, the, the Wright brothers, and technical questions about the best shape of propellers. He patented a propeller, which was with ducts producing hot gases at the end of the blades, actually used by the American uh, Marines later on um, in the Second World War. Anyhow, he, um, when the war broke out in the First World War, he went back to Austria and became a, a very highly decorated, very brave soldier in the Austro-Hungarian army. And then he was taken prisoner. Uh, he was keen on war because it was a test of his character. He wanted to be at the front at the very most dangerous things because he feared, terrified he might be a coward. And the only way to make sure you're not a coward is to test yourself in the most dangerous position. And all that time, he began working with the ideas that were become, going to become the central themes of his philosophy, began developing at that time. <clears throat> then he came to England and uh, on and off spent the rest of his life in England, in Cambridge, uh, making, living little while in Ireland, in, 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 in Norway and very disgusted with the high living of the Oxford and Cambridge colleges. So he saw a Thursday high table at my college in Oxford, but it thoroughly put him off. Lots of wine, lots of nice food, interesting conversation. He didn't have anything to do with that. So he was, a, he was, a, he was an outsider in, in Cambridge, even though he was a highly respected professor. He, he was very much influenced by a, a newspaper uh, columnist called Karl Kraus. And Kraus had the idea that the corruption in Austrian life was ultimately to be put down to corruption in language. So young Ludwig, with his mathematical skills, he thought, if only I could create a perfect language in which it was not possible to deviate from the rules, I'd make this pure language, and it would enable me to pick out from all the things that people said what was true and what was false, and everything else could be set aside. So uh, that, was the, that was his first project, this was the Tractatus, and he wrote most of it on the Eastern Front and finished it off in Austrian prisoner of war camp. It had this, it's still fascinating to people, this perfect language, which was built around the laws of logic, very important part of the, of the story, the perfect laws of logic, and a theory of meaning. The only things that had meaning were words that you could point to the object, teach someone chair, elephant, whatever it was. If you couldn't point to the object, these words were meaningless. So, <clears throat> love, not, not so much meaningless as, as too messy to be of any use to anybody. God. <clears throat> so all of that was excluded. The famous proposition at the end of the Tractatus, whereof one cannot speak 
quote, bracket, in my perfect language, close bracket, thereof one must be silent. So that was his, that was his first, and people were thrilled by this. They thought it was a terrific stop. When he was doing his engineering studies in, in Manchester, he began puzzled about mathematics, mathematics itself. So someone told him he should visit Russell in, in Cambridge. He went to visit Russell. As far as I know the story, Russell said, well, you ought to go and see Frege in Germany on his way back to Vienna. Well, he went to see Frege and it was a total lack of communication. But when he came back, he decided to settle in Cambridge and work with Russell. Russell had been the British end of the development of mathematical logic, logic as a formal system. And Russell tried very hard to reduce all, all philosophical problems to mathematical ones. He wrote this famous book, Principia Mathematica, with, uh, with Alfred North Whitehead. And Wittgenstein got involved in this, but he fell out with Russell quite dramatically over two issues. Wittgenstein was a ter terrible Puritan. Everything had to be perfect and good and uncorrupt, and Russell was a terrible womanizer. He was an awful character, and so Wittgenstein disapproved of him. <clears throat> and he fell out with him over, over logic, because Russell thought that the laws of logic were the most general laws of nature. And Wittgenstein had his fundamental uh, insight way back then that the laws of logic were grammar. They were the laws for organizing speech and writing. They were not laws of nature. So that was the, that was, that was the essential. And he got that from Russell really by conflict. In a sort of, he was influenced by Russell, but really in a kind of uh, negative way. After the First World War and the publication of the Tractatus and the adulation he received from people in Vienna and some people in the UK, he uh, decided that he had completed the work of philosophy. There was nothing more to do. So he tried to find a pure life. He wanted to be a gardener. That was a very pure life. And he wanted to be a school teacher and he went to teach in Trottenbach got into trouble for being too harsh a disciplinary. And gradually, these, his ideas of the perfect language began to be undermined, partly by his own experiences with the children, because they weren't anywhere near doing thinking and acting and talking in the way that the Tractatus children should have done. And, uh, and uh, a man called Ramsey, uh, who came from Cambridge to discuss the Tractatus with Wittgenstein. And gradually, Ramsey's discussions and Wittgenstein's own experience of things began to see that this was a terrible mistake. So he, he came back to England, to, to Cambridge, and essentially started to rework his entire philosophical position within the framework that language is the key but with a different conception of what language is and what it does for you. So that was the, that was the, by 1935 and so he'd completely abandoned all the ideas of the Tractatus. Part of the Russellian theme of the Tractatus is the idea of logical form. That every meaningful statement has a very precise logical form. And so Schreffer went like this, which is the Italian for, I think you're talking a load of rubbish, Ludwig. And he, Schreffer asked, what's the logical form of that? And Ludwig couldn't think of the answer. So that and many other things led him away to think about something about language without the notion of logical form. His second insight was that there were all kinds of mistakes that people fell into, particularly philosophers and psychologists and mathematicians, because they didn't understand 
the way the ordinary language was operating. So they invented models of, of language functioning which were, which were at odds with the way the words were actually used. So he began to see that all kinds of mythical uh, entities like the mind and the law and things of that sort arose because people mistake, mistakenly identified every noun must be a name, every adjective must be a quality, uh, every mathematical sign must be a number. So one, two, three, four, dot, 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 infinity. Well, is that a very huge number? <laughs> and so he began to see, this is a, a nice example. You, you go on adding numbers. You get bigger and bigger numbers. You keep on adding, doing the same thing. What's the end? And uh, so that kind of thing. <clears throat> and so he had the idea of the, the, the analysis of ordinary language to reveal the way meanings were constructed. And they were not at all the business of just naming something. He wanted to, 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 to catch a, capture the idea that most of the time our language is used in practical contexts. So another side of Wittgenstein at this time and later is practice. So, the image he has is of little kids in the school at Trottenbach in the playground playing games, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and so on, ring a ring of roses. So the game is managed by the word. So there's an intimate relation between practice and word. And in the very beginning of the philosophical investigations, there's a wonderful paragraph <coughs> about somebody going shopping. Because I was so good at these little... The person goes shopping with a little piece of paper which says five red apples. <coughs> well, he gets the apples all right, and the, the shopman has a sample to pick the red ones. So what about five? Well, I don't know. Five, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's a, it's a specification of a procedure. One, take an apple. Two, take an apple. Three, take an apple until you've got five. You've, it's, it's a practice. It's a language game. <coughs> so uh, that wonderful idea that you can't detach language from the practices in which it's involved. So if you can't say what the practice is, then you still can say, as in the Tractatus, that there's a lot of nonsense taught when there's no way you can link up the language to something that people can actually do. There are many, many uses of language for all kinds of things, for promising, deciding, doing mathematical work, theorems, the law. Every one of these has its own set of language games, has its own grammar. And it's a huge mistake to try to take the grammar of one of these forms of language and use it to try to understand the other. And of course it leads to the idea of the possibility, though he didn't explore this, of other languages having very different psychological uh, uh, implications. <clears throat> That's the sort of work I do. I work in Spanish. And I also, I don't know Japanese, but I work in Japanese and we're studying Japanese grammar. And these people think differently. Spanish have a different way of, of different kind of emotions. The Japanese have very many different ways of thinking. It opened up a whole way of thinking about language as the instrument with which we, or instruments with which we live our lives. Somebody says, I'm hoping for something. And you might think, well, hoping is, the, is a word for a mental process. Wittgenstein was very against the idea of sticking mental processes, just like Ra, everywhere. So, what does someone, when, when someone says they're, they're, they're hoping for something, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> and what he realized was it means a great many different things. So sometimes, his own example, you put, you're laying out the tea things. 
And someone says, oh, I see Ludwig hopes Russell will come to tea. Other times you're looking out the window waiting for the postman. Sometimes you are thinking about something. You're having an image of the person coming to the door. There's no one thing. So that's what he called a field of family resemblances. These word, this one word is used in all these contexts. And then someone comes along and says, what's the common feature of all of these? Maybe there's this mental process behind all of them. No, says Wittgenstein. There's no such mental process. This is a field of family resemblances. We make a survey, we look for the similarities and differences, and then we'll have no further philosophical problem. There won't be a problem of what's the mental state of hoping. Wittgenstein was very much concerned with meaning. So the behaviorists didn't care about meaning. They were only interested in behavior. So the same gesture, like that, say, like that, might be, now this is the same gesture, and it's the same physical movements, etc. And you might think that, that that was what you were trying to study. But uh, I'm sure you know very well, in Italy, that's goodbye. If you're in the Wild West, it means say it again. And it's got all kinds of things. <laughs> So it's the meaning that's the crucial thing. And of course, that brings you to the context. If you're in, in Rome, ciao, ciao, bambina. <laughs> but in, uh, in Reno, Nevada, say it again, pal. <laughs> and so there's the, 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 once we get the, the context into it, of course, the behaviorism is context-free. That was what Skinner you know, was so bad about it. It was not context-sensitive. Russell believed that language arose by an individual naming a private sensation. And the first part of the private language argument, 245 onwards, is to, is to show you that that idea is absolutely hopeless as the idea of the origin of a language. Because there'd be nothing to stabilize your, your meanings. You have you learn, you have this word red, and you learn it by, by naming a, a color sensation you have. <clears throat> Comes tomorrow. <clears throat> How do you know what the word means? Well, you say, I'll, I can show you, here's red. You say, How do you know that's the same red as yesterday? And so you have to believe something that is logically incoherent, so that Yesterday is gone. If the exemplars of the word red were yesterday's reds, and if they're today's reds, how do you know red means the same thing? And he, of course, being a masochistic sort of guy, it's all about pain. Uh, so that was the first part of the, investi of the, of, of the argument. You need a public, public uh, environment to ensure other people, to ensure that language stays on track. <coughs> However, how do you learn the word pain? And this is one of his most brilliant pieces that's influenced developmental psychology. <clears throat> when, when a little kid is learning a word for a private feeling, he can't learn it by, by mum pointing to the feeling because she can't see his feeling and he can't feel her feeling, so how, do he, how does anybody know they're the same feeling? So, what is the say? Well, expression. So, he began to, do, to develop the, the idea that language arose out of expressions. So, there's an expression of pain, a characteristic human expression, groaning, rubbing the spot. If you're in pain, you have a tendency to, 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 to do that. So, he had this great idea the way we learn the word pain is as a substitute for groaning and rubbing the spot. It's also expressive. So there isn't any question about whether saying I'm in pain is, is a correct statement because I wouldn't be in pain 
if I didn't have a, a tendency to say that. <clears throat> I wouldn't be happy if I didn't have a tendency to smile. And, of course, after I've learned to substitute words for, for natural expression, I wouldn't be happy if I didn't have a tendency to say, I'm happy. So it's, it's an absolutely brilliant succession of arguments <clears throat> to show how the language of, of emotions and feelings and so on can become public.